Okay. Can we start our session, then, please? I introduce myself. My name is Hassan Ali Mehran, and I have the pleasure of chairing this session. One of our uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Vatan Dulst, uh, sent us an email from Kuwait that for family reasons he could not come. So we have a smaller panel, but nonetheless a highly distinguished panel of uh, two great scholars of Iranian economy and politics, uh, Patrick Clausen and Hadisa Ali Esfahani. I think both of them are known to all those who uh, follow Persian studies. Uh, Dr. Patrick Clausen is the director of research of the Institute for Near East Policy in Washington, author of many papers, and is distinguished contributor to the latest uh, monumental work on the history of Iran, uh, monetary history of Iran, uh, from the Safavids to the Gajabas. And uh, a great authority in this area, and I'm sure you're also equally familiar with Professor Hadi um, Sali Esfahani, Professor of uh, uh, Economics at the University of Illinois. And he too uh, has contributed greatly to our understanding of the Iranian economy, in particular since the Iranian Revolution, and this will be the focus of his uh, discussion today. I invite uh, Dr. Clausen to speak on the limited role of the Imperial Bank of Persia. Thank you. This is a very pleasant break from my day job where I spend altogether too much time talking about uh, Iran's nuclear program and its uh, foreign policy strategies. So. Uh, about a decade ago, I had the pleasure of doing research in uh, the archives of the Imperial Bank. And uh, at the time, I was working on uh, monetary history. So uh, unfortunately, I did not do enough of, of my research on the issues I'm discussing today, but I still thought I had some interesting insights I could offer. Now, the uh, classic work about the Imperial Bank, uh, if, if you're interested in this subject, I, I highly commend it to you. A banking and Empire in Iran. It is a company history, but uh, I think it is a, a fair and generally pretty frank uh, uh, history. Uh, unfortunately, uh, shortly after Mr. Jones finished this history, the archives were sent off uh, by the Hong Kong, Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, or HSBC, uh, from London to uh, Hong Kong, uh, stayed there for a number of years, and then were shipped back to London. And in that process of the double move, uh, the system for storing them was entirely changed. And so therefore, it is impossible to replicate any of the references that Mr. Jones provides. One has to go through the archives completely new. One can't, you can't look up any of the references that he provides. There's no way to get from his references to the modern system. Now, what he discusses in considerable detail in, in Banking and Empire in Iran uh, is the uh, interesting and complicated relationships between the Imperial Bank and the British government and British government policies. Uh, and that was indeed a complex relationship. On the one hand, the Imperial Bank as a private bank uh, was not uh, directly responsive always to what the British government wanted it to do. Uh, on the other hand, um, and Mr. Jones doesn't necessarily highlight this, but it is interesting to notice that if you look at the FCO records, you find that um, one of the secretaries of the bank uh, uh, Mr. Rubino is sending to the legation in Tehran uh, detailed analyses of Iran's economic circumstances that he is not chairing with the board in London. In other words, here he is as the head of the Imperial Bank's uh, operations in Iran, and he was being more candid and frank with the legation than he was being with his head office, which I suspect. <laughs> and, and he gets reprimanded for this when they find out. Well, they don't find out about everything. But anyway, the question of the relationship between the Imperial Bank and the British government is not something that I propose to discuss here. Uh, now, what I have written about in some length uh, 
in what uh, our chairman graciously referred to, uh, this monetary history of Iran, is uh, the role of the Imperial Bank in the issuance of, of paper money. And uh, um, the, there are many advantages of paper money compared to uh, metal coin. And um, it, for one thing, it's much easier to ship. And in a country like Iran, where the transportation system is particularly poor at this time, uh, the costs of shipping uh, are very high. Uh, and um, the costs of shipping coin are uh, a real burden on, on business. Um, and then uh, another real advantage of the paper uh, currency is that it requires many fewer resources to produce paper currency than it does to get your hands on uh, the uh, precious metal for coin. Uh, now that's particularly obvious uh, for a country like Iran, which is having to import this, the precious metal. And you see, uh, and uh, we have tables in here to show it, that uh, precious metals for, uh, were a very significant portion uh, of Iran's imports uh, throughout this period of uh, uh, the culture of rule, um, including the late culture period. Um, but even if Iran had had uh, the resources with which to produce these precious metals at home, that would take a lot of effort. And, uh, that couldn't be used elsewhere. And what I would describe in this paper, and what I describe in more detail in my paper for today's event, which by the way I neglected to mention, I have copies up here. If anybody wants one, you're welcome to take one or email me to get uh, the um, And I, I explain that the, the Imperial Bank of Persia uh, did a reasonable job with the introduction of paper currency. Uh, and in particular, uh, let me, before I launch into my largely critical review of the Imperial Bank's role in, in Iran's economic development, mention two important factors, two important pluses in how the Imperial Bank uh, introduces paper currency. And one is that uh, there was no substantial inflation, inflation or debasement of the currency associated with the introduction of paper currency. And typically, when uh, paper currency is introduced, it's done by a government for the purposes of providing additional finance and, and uh, of government operations. And goodness knows that in the late Qajar period, there was a lot of financial pressure on the government, and the government was doing a lot of rather creative things in order to uh, secure loans and get its hands on resources. And had the government been issuing the paper currency instead of a private bank, I, I suspect that we would have seen very substantial uh, debasement of the currency and considerable inflation. After all, uh, the one instrument that the government had to try to take advantage uh, of uh, these kinds of what are called seniorage profits uh, was with the copper currency, where the value of the copper coins that circulated exceeded the value of the metal in the copper coins. And the, there were several very nasty episodes in which um, the, the government and, uh, and, and provincial governors who were generally responsible for issuing copper coins uh, did try to uh, extract considerable resources through the excessive issuance of these coins. Um, so uh, uh, I must say that the Imperial Bank was successful at, at preventing this. Um, and by the way, one of the things I recount in my paper, and one of the things which <laughs> you see an awful lot of in the Imperial Bank archives, is that um, the government is constantly inventive and ways to try to extract money from the Imperial Bank. So that many things which are described of in standard histories uh, um, uh, as um, uh, straightforward commercial transactions, uh, in fact, when you look at the, what the Imperial Bank archives describes, uh, almost invariably, uh, the government was not making the payments that it claimed it was making to the, to the Imperial Bank. And that what appeared on one hand, to be straightforward commercial transactions, you know, the Imperial Bank collecting uh, tax revenues uh, and sending them to Tehran. Uh, the government's very good at figuring out how to make this into a forced loan. And um, so that's one thing that the government, that the Imperial Bank does well, is prevent this kind of inflation that's usually associated with the production of, of paper currencies. And then another thing which the government, which the Imperial Bank does quite well, is that it, it withstands the financial crises. Now, when we wrote this book, uh, financial crises seemed so distant in 
past that nobody could imagine that they would occur. Uh, I think it's easier to refer to people to the experiences of 2008, and uh, people can understand that there can be real financial crises that have a substantial impact on, on the uh, real economy. Uh, and that was a, a standard feature of life at the time uh, that I'm talking about the culture period of the Imperial Bank. Uh, and uh, the Imperial Bank was particularly uh, vulnerable to crises because it had nobody to whom it could turn to. Uh, in other words, if there were a run on the bank, there really were no other banks that could join together. I mean, the, the, the discount bank run by the Russians is, in fact, more likely to organize a run in the Imperial Bank than they are to cooperate with the Imperial Bank about something to do about this. Uh, and similarly with Bazaar and Merchants, and God knows that the Iranian government was in no position to assist. And uh, the legation made it very clear that they were not going to help by the British legation. And London was far away. So that if a run starts, you know, it could take you many months in order to get the uh, resources. And so, uh, in fact, um, um, we have a situation in, in which uh, the Imperial Bank is very exposed. And this is a time of very substantial turmoil. Everyone goes through a revolution, it goes through a war, uh, and uh, several episodes in which Imperial Bank branches are taken over by rebels or uh, um, tribes and just looted of everything down to, uh, uh, and yet the Imperial Bank is able to sustain the currency and there really is no, uh, one possible exception of a few months, there is no period in, in which there's a successful run of the bank or a crisis. So I, I have to hand it to the Imperial Bank on that front. But on the other hand, the main thrust of my paper is to say that in fact the Imperial Bank did a very modest job of, of what should have been substantial advantages from the introduction of modern banking in, into uh, Iran. And in particular, uh, that when you think about um, uh, uh, paper currency, as I said, then that's an important aspect of, of modern banking, is that it's possible uh, to, um, to ship paper currency more readily, and it takes less resources to produce paper currency than um, metal coin. But the Imperial Bank generally insisted on holding more metal coin, specifically silver, uh, because at this time, gold is not really regarded as particularly as money. I mean, people don't regard gold anywhere near uh, as uh, um, uh, liquid as, as silver. Silver is the real money. Um, uh, and the Imperial Bank insists on holding uh, more silver at each branch uh, than it issued notes. And so if there's an increase in note issuance at, at a branch, then there's a, a flurry of correspondence about how you're going to ship the silver to so they will be able to have in their vault more silver than the paper than the currency that they issue, um, and that that cost of shipping is not not minor, uh, and, and the difficulties of doing this is not easy. It's not easy, um, and I think this is a very conservative policy, uh, and I think one ev evidence of that is the fact that we find that a number of merchants start issuing their own cur paper currencies. So a number of uh, Bijak notes, of credit notes, get converted effectively in, into paper currencies. And in fact, there's uh, frequent correspondence in, in, in the archives of complaints by the Imperial Bank uh, about why the government isn't stamping this out. And I, yet, in all that correspondence, I never once saw any um, self-reflection about, well, why is it that these people are able to compete with us? What should we be doing different in marketing our product? What kinds of things should we be offering? So their complaints are about how to stamp out the competition rather than asking how, could, how this evidence shows that there, in fact, is more of a market for paper currency than, uh, than we are satisfied. But the main thrust of my paper is not about the, the paper currency side of it, but it's, in fact, about uh, the other, aspect of, uh, other aspects of modern banking. And that modern banking really is based on deposit tanking and lending. And that's my thing. Now, I suspect that some people here have actually seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, but if you haven't, and that's the classic Christmas time movie that people watch, uh, uh, about a uh, savings and loan. Uh, and uh, in which we see that how the savings of some individuals uh, being deposited in this savings alone are then used as the basis 
for making loans to other individuals with which they can improve their lives and buy homes and start a business, the like. And uh, it's a cheesy movie, uh, but it does have a, a, an explanation that even an elementary school kid can understand uh, of how modern banking's mobilizing of the deposits from individuals makes possible resources which can then add to economic activity. Uh, and that is precisely what the Imperial, the Imperial Bank does not do. Uh, the Imperial Bank uh, does extremely little to mobilize deposits. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Imperial Bank uh, board notes that I can see from a time when deposits are increasing substantially in the 1920s, they have no interest in this. There's not interest. So there's no discussion about what can be done in, in, through new products that are offered, through new instruments, and no discussion about, oh, well, wow, this branch is to be congratulated because they increased deposits. Nah, nothing, nothing. Um, but there was this increase in deposits taking place, especially in that, in that period, um, because after all, banks are a much safer place, a much more convenient place to, to store value than it is uh, to have to um, instead have paper currency. And uh, the, I actually have metal currency. You know, having to store large quantities of metal currency uh, is uh, it's dangerous, it's expensive, it's hard to do. Uh, and and in, in this book, uh, we describe in some detail the, the, how the complaints from many um, European commentators about hoarding of uh, precious metal in Iran are really quite inappropriate because they, what they're describing as hoarding is, is simply Iranians trying to have a store of value which they can call upon in the event of an unexpected crisis in their lives or in their business. And, and in the absence of a modern banking system, uh, you're forced to do that kind of hoarding. And, and so it's not surprising that Iranians, given the opportunity, uh, were learning that deposits in the Imperial Bank made much more sense. So, on the one hand, we don't see a lot of deposits uh, in, and we don't see the Imperial Bank doing much to encourage deposits and deposits do not go anywhere near the extent that they should have. And, and on the other hand, we see even less interest by the Imperial Bank in lending those funds. And so, thank you. In fact, quite the contrary, the board is um, unhappy uh, with uh, lending to, to Iranians. Now, one could say that perhaps that's because of uh, their concern about uh, how well the, uh, the bank managers may have known local business conditions and that they could have been, uh, that these loans uh, might, might have defaulted. And goodness knows there's a very bad episode in 1907 in Cameron Shaw, and the bank loses its, its shirt uh, off of a, a dishonest local employee who makes off with a fair amount of what were supposed to be loans, which in fact he pocketed. But what we see, especially in, in the uh, post-World War I period, it is um, a very detailed information collected by the bank about local business conditions and local business conditions. Now, I unfortunately, because I was concentrating on paper money, I didn't make use of this, but I, I, anybody who's doing work on the Iranian business elite in the 1920s, uh, I would urge you to go and look at the Imperial Bank archives because every quarter, each branch is providing information about who are the biggest businessmen in their city and what are they doing. And so there's a lot of, uh, of, uh, of information about these guys. For my purposes, I would just, all right, let's turn the pages and get through this, but they were quite detailed. And the Imperial Bank, rather than seeing itself as a lending institution, saw itself as an exchange house. Uh, and that they were making more of their money uh, from the import of silver to be converted into coin than they were making from money. Uh, and that's where their real profits were. And so uh, they were engaging in some rather underhanded things. Uh, so for instance, uh, they are able through uh, dubious mechanisms uh, to get permission to import a fair amount of, of coins into Iran that had been made up of the Birmingham Mint. And they mislead the Birmingham Mint into thinking that this is an operation that they're doing on behalf of the government, when they are not. What they are doing is providing the Birmingham Mint with the silver, and getting from it the coins, and then shipping the coins to, to Iran. And so they can take advantage of the difference between the value which the coins circulate in Iran and the value of the uh, silver, which is in it. Uh, 
now, which is not that big. I mean, it's, it's supposed to be 5%. The bank uh, probably, you know, despite the protestations of the contrary, I think that they push the limit on, 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 on how pure the coins are, so it's more like 6% rather than 5%. But anyway, it's money. Um, and at, when it comes to lending, the board is unhappy if there's lending for any purposes to uh, private Iranian individuals. Uh, the lending is basically to the government, uh, and then well, what strict minimum is necessary in order to carry out uh, 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 letters of credit. Um, and what we see, in fact, we don't have any quantitative evidence about how much lending there is by bazaar merchants, uh, primarily through the BJAC me mechanism, uh, but what uh, anecdotal accounts we have uh, would certainly be consistent with, although I can't by any means demonstrate this, uh, that the, these traditional bazaar methods were providing as much financing as the Imperial Bank was uh, for um, uh, Iranian businesses. Uh, and uh, this is a remarkable contrast with the experience of other British colonial banks, um, much less uh, with the experiences of, uh, of other banks. I mean, if you take a look at the same period of time of what Mr. Bank is doing in Egypt, for instance, uh, we see a, a, really, a very spectacular how Mr. Bank is able to uh, provide very significant financing for industrialization, uh, and uh, the Imperial Bank is doing no interest. So I think that this, I, I, I'm sure that you know, Reza Shah does not have a detailed analysis of all of this, uh, but uh, his gut level instincts that the Imperial Bank is not doing what it should to help the country's uh, economic development, and especially the industrialization that was so near and dear to his heart, uh, is when you get right down to it. Correct. When I first started some banking activities in Iran and got to know the banking system, uh, it was at the time that the traders were becoming bankers. Listening to Dr. Klaus and I know, in fact, the original bankers, they're traders dealing in precious metals. <laughs> now I call upon Dr. Sales van der Lille Estahani to talk about the distribution of consequences of economic growth and public spending programs in Iran. My first paper, this is joint with a student of mine at the University of Illinois, uh, is about the distribution of consequences of economic growth and public spending uh, programs in Iran. And by way of motivation, let me start by saying that first, if you look at poverty rates in Iran from 1980s till mid 2000s, they've gone down rather sharply. Uh, and the question is, what's the source? How did this come about? That's the, the key question. What are the mechanisms? Uh, one thing is economic growth. The economy did grow. But the question is, to what extent did that contribute, really? In, in fact, if you look at the experience of most countries around the world in the past three decades, you're going to see that economic growth has been unequalizing. And, for example, in the U.S., uh, economic growth has brought zero benefit to the uh, lower strata of the society. So, it, what was the situation in Iran? Did uh, economic growth help the poor, or was it unequalizing? The one interesting thing about Iran is the massive redistribution mechanisms that uh, is, uh, exist, both through the government and through uh, 
some agent, a number of agencies that have been created after the revolution. And the question is, to what extent did government spending contribute to this reduction of poverty and uh, influence income distribution? To what extent social protection programs were helping out? Did they matter? In fact, you know, one may ask, in which way did they matter? Because it's not very clear when government says we have social protection and help the poor, necessarily the money ends up with the poor. So you need to really measure these and figure out who's benefiting. Uh, a lot of the key issue in these measurements is that sometimes the government may be giving the money to the poor, but it's not very clear that it ends up there. Because the, think about the situation where you give money to a poor neighborhood, families in a poor neighborhood, and they end up uh, spending it on food or other items locally, and then the shop, local shopkeeper raises the prices, so in real terms, these guys need not become much better off. The shopkeeper may be the uh, beneficiary or the landowner who owns the land, either houses or the commercial property may be the ultimate beneficiary. So you really need to look at the full effects of these things rather than just, just who's I immediately getting the money. The case of Iran for understanding the role of social protection programs and economic growth in redistribution is very important because Iran has rather unique political institutions that allow one to actually look at the various experiments, different ways of dealing with uh, poverty reduction. Uh, especially after the revolution, there have been a lot of new institutions and organizations created in order to address poverty. And the question is, how, do they, how are they functioning? How well are they addressing the poverty problem and income distribution problems? Uh, one key example is these uh, quote unquote autonomous agencies like Bonyad uh, Mostazafan or Comité Emdad, the Imam Khomeini Relief Foundation. Uh, they have their own assets, they're under the super supervision of the supreme leader, they're independent of the government, that's the sense in which I'm calling them autonomous. They're because they have their own assets, they have the resources, they have the property, they can actually spend money regardless of what the government is doing. Uh, they, they do get money from the government, but they also can have uh, power to spend or to change their expenditure autonomously. Uh, how are they doing and to what extent are they contributing to poverty reduction in Iran? Uh, one interesting, this is not something I'm, I do in this paper, but part of, sort of the bigger uh, research agenda that I'm following is that uh, to what extent are these new organizations like autonomous public welfare agencies, a good fit for political system in Iran. Because the political system in Iran has a particular shape with uh, having the position of supreme leader that stands above the executive and, and also other branches of the government. And the question is, in this setting, what's the best way to add, uh, set up an organization that wants to address poverty? Uh, one of the biggest problems that poverty reduction agencies associated with the government have is that when the economy is not doing very well, the government is short of funds, usually cuts the funding for these agencies as well, and they're supposed to be helping out the poor during a recession when the money is not coming in. So, uh, in, in fact, the problem of poverty could be exacerbated by that mechanism. These organizations being independent of the government, ha having their own resources, might be able to deal with the poverty reduction problem exactly during the uh, recessions. So, so th this is uh, how they're related to uh, the political system, which, 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 sort of, which is the source of power that affects them and what are the assets that they can maintain. These are interesting questions that uh, could be addressed. Uh, in, in fact, there's, there seems to be uh, relative success given the poverty reduction that we've seen. 